and welcome to a very special bonus episode of Nintendo Therapy, a show in celebration about all things Nintendo. My name is Harrison, and this episode might come as a fun surprise for any returning listeners today to talk about their game, Bug and Seek, a bug-catching game recently released for the Nintendo Switch. I'm joined by Shara. Uh, Shara, before I introduce your game more, how are you today? Hi, Harrison. I'm doing very well, thank you. <laughs> so I want to uh, give your game a little more of an introduction for you. Uh, uh, Bug and Seek is now available on Steam and Nintendo Switch as of June 15th. Um, That's right. Demos are available on Steam, and will it be okay. available on Switch as well? Yes, we are working on the demo now and trying to release before the end of July. That's great. So, uh, demo demos uh, on Steam, Nintendo Switch very soon, and... Uh, is your DLC coming to Switch as well? DLCs are coming this week, actually, and then uh, and then the demo by the end of the month. So we are working hard to get caught up with everything that's on Steam for Nintendo Switch. Wow. wow. Okay. So, uh, bug and seek in this game, catch bugs and clues in this cozy bug catching sim creature collector styled like an eight bit classic. You've bought the local <laughs> bug museum. Abandon after mysterious robbery. Fill orders, build your collection, and upgrade your skills and equipment while exploring Bugberg and uncovering its secrets. Collect up to 220 insects and, well, possibly more depending on how much DLC they're planning on releasing. Who knows? That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, start as a Kickstarter. Uh, surpass your Kickstarter goals and have had now a successful release on multiple platforms. So, Shara, um, just... Congratulations to you for, for Thank everything. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been quite an adventure. <laughs> I was not a initial supporter. I just I did not know of the game until I guess right after you released on Steam. And I always try to reach out to any indie developer that I see come over to Switch um, that has a game I'm excited about. Um, Thank so you. to, um, we are a Nintendo podcast. I have to start with a Nintendo question. Sure. Um, uh, oh, also I saw you were on a featured list on the Nintendo eShop. I didn't write it down, but do you remember what that was? Like a creature I collector we or? Yes, it was creature collectors. We were in that featured list, which was a surprise and was very, very grateful for that. That's a lot of fun. I mean, you, you, you're right next to Pokemon. I mean, your game's <laughs> right next to Pokemon. On that blows there. my so, mind. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my initial question to you relates to that. Uh, of course, Nintendo Podcast, um, I'm a lover of all games, Nintendo included. I've never imagined developing a game. That's mm -hmm. not where my creative outlook has ever imagine things um sure. were there any additional feelings or emotions that you had in the process of getting your game on a nintendo system that was different from initially releasing your game yes i um i mean i love steam but nintendo definitely felt like uh, another level up for us um there's someone else you know, just saying whether the game could be on Switch. There was someone else approving the code, um, someone else approving trailers and all those pieces of it. And um, and Nintendo is just a very different kind of company. And I have a lot of respect for the way that they work, uh, the processes that they have in place. As a player, I know that what I'm getting from Nintendo is always going to be quality and consistent. So as a developer, to have a product on Nintendo felt very validating. Um, and Craig and I always, we often said to each other, oh, we've made it now. Like we've made it now that we're on Switch. That makes us feel like real game developers. Um, most of the time, we just still feel like we don't know what we're doing um, as we're fumbling through the next steps. Um, but there was definitely something very um, monumental about seeing our game on the Nintendo Switch. Well, I think that's beautiful. I think, you know, the, the feeling of not knowing is just part of 
any part of being an adult. Um, <laughs> like I'm a like I'm a teacher, and I've always I always talk about how I don't think any parents really have an idea. Like some are better than others, but parents in general don't really have an idea and they're always trying to figure it out as mm. they go along no matter That's what right. in my opinion and that feedback loop we joke that that feedback loop is like 25 years before you really know if you if your decisions totally screwed up the kids so we're uh, we're still in that process trying to figure that out too yeah wow so so going to nintendo is it a difficult process or was it a difficult decision to go in that direction uh, the decision was easy. I think we knew that a lot of our audience, because we're developing a very cozy game, I'm a cozy game player. So I just, it felt very natural for me uh, to be on Nintendo Switch. And I know that that's how I love to play most of the time. I'm one of those gamers that loves to just cozy up in bed and play at the end of the day or first thing in the morning. And so Nintendo Switch just felt very natural. So the decision was pretty easy for us. But then going forward, how do we actually become Nintendo developers? And how do we actually get it on the platform? All those questions really began to unfold as we got into the Kickstarter campaign and tried to see, is this really something that we can do? Um, and we, for a while, actually pursued a publisher um, and submitted Bug and Seek to several publishers and got no's which is, you know, that happens. That's very common. Uh, but we just took it in stride. Okay, this is not our route. We'll find another route. And uh, and ultimately, we had used our Kickstarter funds to hire a porting studio to help us out. And those guys at One Pixel had a Nintendo developer account with Nintendo Switch. And uh, they were very gracious to say, you know what, if you really need a publisher and someone to help you get on that platform, we'll just act as publisher. And so they, um, we signed a very generous agreement with them, generous for us, and, uh, and they helped us get on the platform. So without their generosity, I'm not sure what we would have done. We'd still, we may still be searching, but it was, um, it was probably not the typical route to getting on Nintendo, but that's what worked for us. And so we're, we're so glad that we found a path. Wow. Uh, sounds like you learned a lot in that process. We did. <laughs> we very much so. I know the the next game we do, I'm I'm hoping that we'll be able to publish the next game ourselves, but uh but we'll certainly start that process differently the second time around because of all we've learned. Wow. So that leads us into my next question. Uh the inspiration of this game, were there any games that directly inspired Bug and Seek and do you have any other favorite Nintendo or perhaps Nintendo cozy games? Sure. Uh, I, we won't definitely not try to hide it. The uh, Pokemon and Animal Crossing were two of our biggest inspirations. Pokemon, obviously, for catching creatures. Um, for You probably know this, but Nintendo trivia is that Pokemon started as a, a love for bugs. The creator loved catching bugs in his backyard or at least observing bugs. And that was a lot of the inspiration for Pokemon. And so that was fun to hear that little bit of trivia as we were working on Bug and Seek. And um, and then Animal Crossing, my my son actually owned our Animal Crossing account. And so if you're familiar with Animal Crossing, you know that whoever owns that account and that profile gets to do all the like moving forward parts of the game. And anyone else is just kind of in the island, um, maybe doing a few tasks, but we don't really have a lot of control. So I was always that person like, what can I do? while he is actually doing the quests and all the fun things on Animal Crossing. Um, but bug catching, he would let me do in that game. And that was my favorite thing. I love to do the bug catching in Animal Crossing and, and thought, I really wish I could just do this for a few hours as I was playing. And, uh, and ultimately, we turned it into a game where you can. Yeah. And you can in Animal Crossing. Uh, Animal Crossing is my all-time favorite franchise uh, yeah. to, to, to the point where if it comes up on this podcast, I don't tend to talk about it too much because any returning listener is going to know that I'm the Animal Crossing guy. But sure, I mean, I was 12 years old when the, the, uh, the GameCube version, I, I call that the original version, came yeah, out yeah. and... It was the first game that I ever played that had a had a live clock. It was the first game I ever just 
would just hang out on. Like as a kid, I would just have it up on my screen and I just uh-huh. hang out in the town. Um, so it, it created, it was the first game that created that sort of magic for me. Um, that's like, oh, if you're not playing the game, the game is still going on. You can create that lore. That's awesome. Uh, that's very cool. I know that, um, well, well, you mentioned your son. Didn't your son help you develop a game? He did. He did. My, I have two boys. They're 13 and 10 now. Um, and so my, my oldest really got me into games uh, altogether. And, uh, and then my youngest was a lot of the inspiration for Bug and Seek and his, um, his enthusiasm over bugs. He went through a, a real bug phase for a bit and we would go out in the backyard and hunt. So they've both been very really instrumental in, um, in me starting this career and, um, and just continuing with inspiration for us. But my oldest, um, who's 13 now, he loves pixel art and spent a lot of time watching tutorials and learning how to draw really great pixel art. And I'm still trying to um, match his skill level with, with my pixel art. But he really coached us at the beginning of development um, and coached us in you know what size we should use and color schemes and shading and all these kind of things. And that was so fun to let him drive that for a little while. Um, and he actually did a lot of the furniture that's in Bug and Seek. Um, and some of the more complex pieces, we would joke that if we just started something and made it look really terrible, he would come in and say, oh, no, 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 you can't do it like that. And then he would just take over and finish it. So that was kind uh-huh. of our, our parent trick to get him to help us out a little bit. Um, and it worked a good bit of the time. Wow. Wow. And, and, and now he's now he's helped develop a game on a Nintendo console. He can. Right. He can, right. How many he can, kids he can, can tell us that? Right? Yeah, it's it, the connection is one of the coolest parts for me. Uh, I was talking on this podcast recently about how. Um, I had a difficulty with a Steam game, and I just messaged the developer on Discord where we are talking right now. Um, mm-hmm. I messaged him on there, and he helped me find a solution to it. And it's so funny to think back to when I was a kid, you would have like your Nintendo Life magazine, and there uh-huh. would be a there'd be like an 800 number. It's like, and it's like a dollar a minute. You call up and be like, Hey, I'm trying to get through the water temple. And, and they would, you know, and they would help you through that. And now you just, now you can just talk to the the developer, just right. go straight to like, if I, if I have difficulty with your game, I'll just say, what's it's up. A, it's a very different, very different climate for games now. Um, and, in all kinds of ways. And I, I love that part. I did not anticipate post-release being so busy with Bug and Seek. I, I think my expectation was that we would hit that release button and and then we'd be like, okay, what's next? Let's go to the next thing. Uh, but we've really we've stayed full time with Bug and Seek because there's so much uh, community management. There is there are opportunities to share the game on other platforms and um and it's really been fun to get to know the players. Uh, through the Steam community and through our Discord server, and that's been uh, that's been a really rewarding piece of it for me. So I am I'm very glad that I get to do this in the age of indies, where um, where interaction with players is such a big piece of development. You know, I I left it off of the intro, and I meant to go back to it. Oh man. Okay. All right. So we're we're recording this on. On the morning of July 5th, 99 reviews, Shara, 99 yes. reviews of your game on Steam. You know what? It'll be over 100 by the time we, we release this episode. That'll be great. I'll celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and hey, and, and I will mention too, 97%. 99 reviews. And hey, like a great part about your game too is that um chances are anyone who plays this game is going to know whether or not this game is for them and if you Mm -hmm. don't there's also a demo so there's no reason to leave anything negative i never (laughs) thank you (laughs) i I never understood that like like if you don't like it you know play the demo first you know that's that's just 
you know, why it's there. Anyways, um, <laughs> is it is it ever is it ever difficult working with your family because that's not something I think every family can do. <laughs> Yeah, um, it is. I mean, to be honest, you these are the people that, you know, we, we know each other the best and we can get under each other's skin the, the best. Um, but it's also I, I just think that the some of the most rewarding things in life are also the most difficult and, and we have to work for it. And so uh, Craig and I, and we've been married 15 years. He joined me about two years ago, full time. Um, in this adventure, when he he was given a position at his other job to move up or step away, and he really just felt like it was time for him to step away. And so we said, well, let's make a go of this video game thing and see if we can do it full time. And uh, and so we that was that was a choice for us, and we really just jumped off that cliff and and had to navigate. It was probably six months of trying to navigate, like how do we work together on a daily basis? Uh, because I, really, I think it was harder for me because I had been stay at home mom. I had been making games just more as a hobby or you know without any pressure of a deadline or a budget or anything. I was just like working on my on my own stuff. But having him come in full time, it was like, oh, now he's in my space. <laughs> he's in <laughs> he's in our home with opinions that he didn't have before. And he's in the office making decisions that he didn't have any say in before. So it was a lot of um, of just kind of reconfiguring for us what that looked like. And um, and I feel like we've navigated it well. We've certainly had our share of, of arguments, but we um, you know, we're, we were on the same page that we had the same goal. And um, and I feel like we've figured it out pretty well. I'm sure we'll have our fair share of arguments to come. But um, but I love that he gets to do this with me. Um, and that's really become the main goal for a while. It was, OK, let's finish the game and get it out. And now it's how do we keep doing this? How do we maintain this lifestyle where we get to spend all this time together? Because it's been really it's been really rewarding. Yes, yeah, great. And it seems like the feedback that I've seen is are from people that perhaps relate um, or just enjoy that. Just it's a little bit extra for them to know that they are supporting or playing a game from a, a family, um, yeah. someone that has those, those same sort of values. It's just something that I've seen a lot from of the feedback from your Kickstarter or whether it's on steam or whatever else it might be. So Hey, that's, well, we, we appreciate that's that really for cool. sure. It is. Yeah, it is our, our family's livelihood. It is um, this weird lifestyle that we've chosen. We live out in the woods. Um, I call myself a stress homesteader. So I, I'm like, I'll, if there's a really stressful day or any kind of launch, any kind of release day, I'm, I'm like, I need to be outside. I need to be outside planting something, growing something with my hands. Um, so we have just this really weird lifestyle of making games and living in the woods and doing stuff on our land. And um, we, we also homeschool our kids and we're, we're real active in our homeschool community. Um, but we, it, it's just kind of a strange lifestyle that we've adopted. Um, I will say too, that there's that idea of presenting ourselves as this is, this is it, this is who we are was, um, was not our natural inclination at the beginning. We, we really thought, you know, if we're going to release a game and we want to be a professional studio, we need to present ourselves as a professional studio. And so you know, we tried to make sure that everything looked very much like other studios we wanted to emulate, which is just natural business, right? It's just as you're growing a business and trying to think entrepreneurially. But we had some advice from um, someone at Tilt Games, a friend, Eric Kovac, that we we really just, we heard him on a podcast and reached out and said, hey, we really like what you have to say. Can you give us some advice? And his advice to us was just be, just be Shara and Craig. Don't try to present yourself as a, an experienced, you know, um, ten person studio or whatever. The, your your logo and your present your presentation is going to raise expectations for people. You need to let them know that this is two people making a game, supporting their family, um, and I think people are really going to respond to that. And sure enough, he was absolutely right. And so we just we said, you know what? Let's just be real about who we are. And this is what we're doing. And this is the best that we can do. 
And people are people have responded so kindly to that, um, which just makes us feel very feel very loved and supported through the whole process. Yeah, that's right. And I think communication is is just so important um, in this atmosphere in this gaming community now. Because um, mm-hmm. I I think about I I support tons of soul developers, tons of indie developers, and it's hard to know sometimes who to correctly invest in uh yeah because there are times where i'm super excited about a project and i speak and i even have connections with the developers i speak with them and then um for whatever reason it might go away or 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 maybe they reach a certain amount of success and then their their focus shifts or they release a DLC when the game's not complete. Things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, it's it's tough. There's a lot of a lot of different um, approaches to doing indie development for sure. Right, and, and, and communication is key because I, I think I think most of us I like to I would like to think the majority of gamers are just normal people. Like like hey mm-hmm. like okay like there was a mistake or this didn't go as planned and. But now, but now you're communicating that it didn't go as planned. That's fine, yeah. you know. Like, I think I think most of us ha- also have game have other games to occupy us if you know there's a delay as well. Right. Um, right. Yeah, we've certainly appreciated the the grace from our community when we've you know we've released some an update. I, I will I will say if I release an update, I'm gonna have to release a day one patch because I don't I've yet to release that update with zero mistakes in it, um, and that's just that's just my humanity. And people have been so kind and gracious to just be glad that I fix it quickly uh, rather than being negative that it happened at all. Mm-hmm. Right, and then, and now you're also on a Nintendo platform, and I, I and I get feedback sometimes right. of that of that sometimes you're at the mercy of Nintendo um, pressing the buttons, and you know. Yes, that's a lot different whatever. than on Steam for sure. Um, now we have to wait for Nintendo approval for a patch, so it it's definitely caused us to do more thorough testing and have multiple sets of eyeballs on everything that we submit to Nintendo because we know once it's out there, we cannot submit any kind of update for a little while uh, just because the process takes time. Uh, on your about page, you mentioned you mentioned the word play five times. Um, and I know that um, uh, you uh, you homeschool and education is my main focus. Uh, right been teaching for a while uh for the past seven years been doing esl education um have you ad- have you adopted play-based learning into your own teaching style yes absolutely um i'm a huge fan i'm obviously a huge fan of play i just think there's so much that happens in our brains and there's so much science behind the research um so much research behind that to say that our our brains just shift when we're in play mode and they're very open and receptive to to learning, but also to relationship building. Um, there's healing from trauma that can happen during play. So I, I just think play is such a valuable tool and something that we as a culture, uh, we do not embrace um, the way that we could uh, and use to our benefit. And so it's usually in the context of kids, uh, especially when we talk about play and learning, is it most often happens in the context of kids, but wow, I would love to see that idea embraced even as adults in adult settings of how do we play and learn to heal from some of the wounds that we carry, or how do we play and learn new things as we're playing? Um, I just, I think there's so much value in play. So yes, as a, as a mom, as a homeschool parent, um, Play is a huge part of what we do. I've, if I can find a game to support something that we're learning, 100%, we'll go for it and do extra game time. Because uh, I would much rather I would much rather teach that way. I would much rather they learn that way. And it just gets in there. They'll remember things from a game like they will not remember things from a book. So, um, so I guess that's a huge win for me. Well, that's great. I think uh, play-based learning or... 
<laughs> I think it's I think it's we call it theme based learning just because it's less controversial sounding. Uh, yeah. For example, where I'm from, um, I, I have a few friends that are in uh, play based learning schools, but they call them theme based learning, and it's a, it's a little bit easier of a, a of a selling point because mm -hmm. it's still it's still a a difficult but, topic or even controversial topic in a in a school setting but a lot of parents i mean i mean parents are i'm going to say our age share i'm going to say mm -hmm. our age where mm -hmm. they they understand that education looks a lot of different ways and yes. those schools do a lot of cool things um i even have friends that they've gotten there I don't know what license you need to drive a bus, but but they have a school bus and any and any teacher can just go and drive it and go to the park <laughs> at any time. That's uh, awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I think COVID did a lot for um, adjusting our idea of education, too, as a lot of schools were forced to pivot during that season. So it's been really interesting to see that evolve over the years and even as things turned back to quote unquote normal, um, we still see schools, I think, adopting some of the, the technology that they picked up during that season. A lot of parents I saw had to homeschool during, you know, for the, or do virtual learning for those few months during lockdown. And now they are committed to homeschooling um, for a longer term, just because they really found something valuable in that space. So it's been, it's been interesting to see the shift, at least in our communities here. Uh, yes, it's a much bigger conversation. Uh, I think right. I think homeschooling just um, more than ever in in the states is 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 um, much bigger, and is we're seeing a lot of different types of families. I guess I'll say, but I think mm -hmm. I'm I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of leave it there. I think um, uh, that's great. Um, wow, I just with your family a lot developing games and uh share it is there anything else that you'd like to promote while you're here is there anything else that you're working on or where can we find you sure uh, you can find me at so peculiar.com which is just a strange word but that's what we picked for our studio um s-o-p-e-c-u-l-i-a-r.com and uh, and that's information about Bug and Seek. It's information about our studio. We had there's another project that I started on that I was learning and teaching myself with um, that we just put on pause while we did Bug and Seek. So I'm hoping to pull that back out in the next year and um, and continue progress on that. And then and then on to who knows what else. Um, beginnings are my favorite parts of the project but I'm really trying to be disciplined and wait on a beginning until we get to a real uh, good place with Bug and Seek where I don't, I'm not full time at it. So uh, really looking forward to starting that next one. But in the meantime, I would say sopeculiar.com. You can sign up for our emails and then stay apprised of whatever comes next for us. Check out Bug and Seek, either Steam or N Nintendo Switch, and there will be a demo up. So um, if you like, the creature collecting genre, there's really no excuse to not at least try out this game. Um, Cher, this has been great. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on today. And um, listeners, as a reminder, uh, we're Nintendo fans, not Nintendo experts. Follow us wherever you find uh, your social media, including on YouTube under Nintendo Therapy Podcast. We have our weekly episodes, and we will continue to have fun bonus episodes moving forward. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, thank you all, and see you next time.